welcome back and good afternoon everyone. So I guess um, before we hand over to our wonderful panel here, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming along. And a particular thank you to the Conservatory of Music as well for their partnership in, in working with us around uh, this research exhibition and the commitment to our students and research at the university. Uh, my name is Edward Luca. My role in the university is Associate Director of Academic Services within the University Library. And I'm a little bit biased, but I think that we have some of the best jobs in the university because we get to work with our amazing faculties and university schools, our researchers and students, and events like today give us just a small window into the amazing work that everyone's doing. Um, we're also really excited to have the research exhibitions back. Um, as Neil had alluded to, it's been a little bit, a little bit of time has passed since the last one, um, so it's great to be back and uh, hopefully everyone will have an opportunity to take a look uh, following our panel discussion this afternoon. So um, a few weeks ago, uh, Julia had, um, we had an opportunity with Julia to walk through the exhibition uh, for library staff and hear some of the stories. And so I think we're in for a treat with our panel discussion. So speaking of stories, um, yours could be next. Um, so I wanted to talk about, I guess, the upcoming EOI process for a future research exhibition in 2024. So we run these uh, once a semester and we're looking for um, people to get involved with our next research exhibitions. So we're especially interested in uh, proposals that provide opportunities for collaborations with coursework curriculum at the university, festival events, or other cultural organizations. Um, it's also a great opportunity uh, in working on the exhibitions to engage with the library's rare books and special collections team. We've got a lot of treasures amongst our collection. So um, you'll see at the entrance as you're leaving, there's a QR code there to submit a proposal for a future exhibition. And our closing date for submissions is the 15th of October. So without further ado, I'll just briefly welcome our panel. So we've got uh, Julia Rissaniello, Victoria Monk, and Dr. Amanda Harris. This is a conversation on our research exhibition at the library titled Listening Back. So without further ado, hand over to Amanda to introduce everyone. Thanks, Thank Edward. So Thanks, Edward, and such a lovely way to spend a Friday afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for, um, for coming along to this. It's been lovely so far. I want to just re repeat the acknowledgement that we meet here on Gadigal Country. Um, I think reminding ourselves every time we come together that we're on Aboriginal Country and that the songs of Aboriginal people that have been sung here forever still resonate in everything we do and the music that we make here is is always in relationship to the country that we're on, I think. Repeating those acknowledgements reminds us of that, whatever we're doing. So I'm really delighted to be here um, talking about this exhibition, which has been very exciting um, to see develop. And so I'll just give a, a brief introduction um, for those of you who don't already know about Julia and Victoria. So Julia Rossignolo is a historical violinist um, and a researcher of Australian musical cultures. She's currently a PhD student here at the University of Sydney, which you um, probably know. She has a scholarship in music history and creative practice, and we work together on a, a, um, an Australian Research Council funded project, um, uh, along with other colleagues here, including Neil. Uh, and she's also a recent recipient of the National Archives of Australia Postgraduate Scholarship. Ju Julia has performed with many of Australia's leading historical performance ensembles, and she has a really wonderful recent article in uh, published in Musicology Australia, which I recommend to all of you, on the Australian violinist Cyril Monk. And speaking of monks, um, our <laughs> other <laughs> panellist here is Victoria Monk, um, who is a prize-winning artist. Uh, she has been a multimedia artist for 35 years in performance, community arts, as an exhibitor of printmaking and sculpture. And the, the list of prizes I have here are so extensive, I don't think I can read all of them, so I'll just mention a couple, mm. um, including being a finalist in the Biennial Project, um, the Venice Biennial 2022, um, and a finalist in the Adelaide Perry Drawing Prize of 2020, um, and other prizes in uh, sculpture, uh, in the Northern Beaches, in Barrel, Hunters Hill, uh, all over the place, uh, really mm -hmm. quite a remarkable career in the arts. And... Um, Victoria has also received grants from the Australia Council from the Arts and Northern Territory Arts Council um, and uh, Community Cultural Development Board. And she also has a Masters in Creative Arts um, and some other wonderful qualifications. So it's a pleasure to have you both here. 
And so the idea of this panel is to talk about um, the exhibition that's down outside the library, which we'll invite you to go and have a look at afterwards. And the path to the exhibition also leads you to the catering and refreshment. <laughs> so, you know, just in case you were thinking of ducking off, don't do that because that's how you get to <laughs> um, And so um, Julia has curated this exhibition. It comes out of her research project and also her creative work. So we wanted to start by asking Julia if you can tell us a bit about your research project um, that the exhibition comes from and how you came across the kinds of sources that sort of prompted that and then informing the exhibition as well. Yeah. So um, the project uh, at the moment is called Looking Forward, uh, Listening Back, and it's about um, Australian violinists of uh, the golden age of the early 20th century. And the project started out, it was always going to be a sort of um, exploration of performing practices in Australia in the early 20th century. And, um, but the project really took a remarkable turn um, quite early on when I found um, a piece of music in the Conservatorium Library. I was there, um, I was there looking for some music to play. Um, there was a piece that I had read about in various newspaper articles, the Arthur Benjamin Sonatina. So I literally just went to the library to go and get a copy. Um, and there were two copies to choose one, one super nice, shiny new one, and one really tattered brown um, <laughs> falling apart one. But the brown falling apart one, actually, when I pulled it out, it had the words Cyril Monk, 1925, in blue pencil. And, um, like, I was sort of tingling with excitement because the the name was familiar to me from my reading of, of concerts of that era. Um, it didn't mean a lot, but I, I just knew I'd found something really, really pertinent to my work because I was really interested in the way that um, performance annotations can tell a story of uh, forgotten performing practices. And and as I always wanted to go there, but I wasn't expecting to find um, something so pertinent just sitting on the shelf of the library. So I immediately started sort of going through all the other things and um, I pulled out another a uh, number of other scores that had his signature or the same blue pencil writing. Um, so that was a really exciting moment because I, I sort of felt like I've, I've I found a bit of a time capsule, a bit of a window into um, another period um, in terms of performance style. And I quickly went about sort of discovering who Cyril Monk was. So um, I think that Cyril Monk's probably an unfamiliar name to most of us, um, but in, in the early 20th century in Sydney, he was um, the most prominent violinist for a number of decades. He was a trial prodigy. He studied two years in London with Guido Pini and came back to Sydney to sort of lead the earliest um, Sydney Symphony Orchestra, um, the one that started in 1908, uh, long before the ABC. Um, he was one of the first staff members at the Conservatorium. He had a very famous string quartet, the very first string quartet in Sydney that had a regular series. And um, yeah, he was sort of touted as sort of the best, the best violinist in the Commonwealth, but he's not a name that's sort of familiar to, to us today. So. Um, I went about looking for more materials and um, it turns out that he also published a lot of arrangements and transcriptions and they're in the National Library of Australia and the State Library. And they're wonderful too because in, in that sense those editions um, and those transcriptions, they have all his fingerings and his bowings and his tempo markings in them and whilst they're not, um, they're the kind of thing that I think, you know, growing up our teachers said, don't play from those editions, just get the urtext, don't play from that. Um, but uh, even though they don't really tell the story of the composer's intentions, they're an amazing snapshot of that particular time and place and, and that individual's sort of um, take on the music. So mm -hmm. there's loads of that. Um, I also found a, a recording um, from a radio broadcast in the National Film and Sound Archives. So I'm gathering all this material together and, and hoping to flesh out this, this picture of a violinist. And, um, yeah, I I was given the names of Cyril Monk's relatives, I think, from the academic liaison librarian at the time. So I had the names of, of his children and grandchildren and I sort of couldn't find very much uh, on his children and I, I don't know how I came to do it, but I ended up looking on Facebook, um, <laughs> the, the, the font of all uh, knowledge, and uh, I found a Victoria Monk who lived in, in Newtown or, and was an artist and sort of looked like could could be a, a match and I actually went back to I went back through my Facebook chats to see what I wrote to you like I think it's going back for years now and I sort of said hi <laughs> I'm a research student and I'm researching Cyril Monk and um uh, I don't know if you're his granddaughter and sorry if you're not his granddaughter but if you are his granddaughter <laughs> I, I'd really love to talk to you about 
um, Cyril Monk because I'm really interested in his his playing style, and that's that's how I met. That's how we met. That's how we met, and um, the rest is history. Um, but um, and it's it's been yeah wonderful to but to have Victoria's input in this project and all the materials mm. she's brought to it. So there's a starting point of finding scores, but it ends up meeting people, which you know have a whole other side to the story. So how was that for you, Victoria? Just getting this sort of Facebook message from. Well, it's terrific because a lot of this stuff, like Papa, is uh, it's Cyril. Mm. Papa is forgotten. So having somebody interested just sparked up. So of course, I thought it was fabulous. Mm. So we made arrangement, and then COVID was it? it was during yeah. COVID. So yeah. we had to kind of working around that. And then I, of course, was delighted to bring out a box full of um, uh, photograph albums and anything I could find at home. So, yeah, that was the start. I mean, that's the dream as a researcher, to contact someone who not only is happy to be contacted, but then immediately pulls out boxes <laughs> of, of further material. So, but, and Julia came to you talking about having found these scores with markings mm. in them. Was that a surprise yeah. to hear that yeah. those scores were Because I was very young. So I, I didn't have any of that kind of history. Um, you know, he was a wonderful sort of grandfather, so that kind of thing. I mean, there was music always around, but no, all that kind of academic stuff was, you know, way over my head at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And and so the, what, 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 are in, what were in the boxes that you, you had? Well, had there was um, <laughs> uh, the programs, um, and then there were mostly albums. A lot of them, some of them aren't relevant because they're of, holiday snaps and various things, but some were of, I guess, uh, like the Austral Quartet, um, Auntie Miri and Alfred Hill, you know, so mm -hmm. those sort of things. Um, and then I, of course, brought out the, the medals, um, but didn't discover till later that there were more medals, which somehow I think he got rid of them, according to my sister, which I'm not sure exactly the story about that. But yeah, mm -hmm. mostly yeah. in the, the albums. Yeah, and the beautiful... Um... Uh, it's down in the exhibition, the Austral String Quartet that Cyril Monk played in that he was so famous for at that time, like bringing um, modern European music, like they were the first to um, play like the Ravel String Quartets and, and Debussy, they were the first people to do it in Sydney, was really um, pioneering and, and they were really known for the Australian music they played, which was quite um, different at the time, but um, Victoria's got all the concert programs all bound in a beautiful leather book and they're down in the exhibition and they're a real like, treasure trove of... Well, it's funny about the, the program notes. Of course, the, my uncle put them together and then he only gave it to me maybe five years ago because he's now going through, he's 90 plus. Mm -hmm. So he's going through all these things. And so this, this program book is great because it actually serves, but otherwise it would be just loose papers. Mm. Yeah, so that's pretty good. So there's obviously some sense in the family too of keeping these things, that, that these are important to our our recent history, even even though, as you say, you know, often people don't know about Cyril Monk. They don't necessarily know yet. Yeah. But but obviously you all know that there's an important yeah. story here that needs Usually to be Usually it's violinists <laughs> who beat through the con and things like that. Well, but there's a generation missing that mm. don't know, like the young people here don't know who he is. It's yeah. Yeah, forgotten. And you, and you casually mentioned there Auntie Mary and <laughs> Alfred Hill. So obviously it's not just... Cyril Monk, who is your grandfather, but also our music Vi teacher, uh, and Mary Hill, your music yeah, teacher, yeah. and your grandmother Vani Monk, yeah, that's uh, right, as well, the composer. Yeah. And so this is a whole sort of circle of importance. Well, it was our world. Yes. Our world was a music world, and within this community, so they all lived next door. I mean, they're all just within. And so my grandparents, their place was my playground, so I'd go there, and I, I really loved dance, so that's where I used to dance. So it's great. Yeah, and that's and so um, can you describe a bit of that 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 place where you know oh, where you were as a child in Mossman, um, but before the bridge was built. I mean, I'm not as I'm older, but um, not a, anyway. The, they built their houses there to look over Sirius Cove. It was a artist camp at one point, and then musicians did join the camp, um, and I think that might have been the inspiration for Alfred Hill to build a house. Um, so my grandfather built next door, and so Mary and Alfred lived there. Grandfather lived there. They had a big block of land. They subdivided it. So my father built a house, and my aunt built a house. So we all lived there. But in those days, it was not Mossman, as you know, sort of up, sort of up 
other class stuff. It was actually really quite bohemian. So that was, um, yeah, that was what it was like. And so these, I mean, you know, you find these stories, there are there are these physical objects, but what does it bring, what different sort of aspects to your research does it bring Julia to then connect with people who hold these stories in different ways, have these kind of stories about family and yeah. the past? How has that shaped things for you? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I think when I set out to do this research project, I had no intention of um, doing interviews or having participants yeah. or, or sort of doing that kind of study. It's just because it's probably not my personality. Like I think I really love to be with a book or I love to be with a, a score. Um, so I wasn't planning to be sort of this, to be a far reaching study that would be talking to lots of people. Um, but having met Victoria and, and the wonderful like results of that um, experience, um, it, it had really pushed me to do that more <laughs> and so in a way um like talking to people and relatives has brought to light lots and lots of materials that just wouldn't have been available to researchers or to, to me um so yeah and so you know in terms of like being able to find um photographs and concert programs and homemade recordings and some of these things that have come to light because of the project because of uh, cold calling <laughs> relatives or um yeah you know um tracking people down I think it's really enriched the research because it feels really it feels really original it feels like um yeah I've sort of trod, trod a sort of different path in, in terms of the yeah, digging up some findings but it's it yeah it feels really enriching and it feels like maybe stories that might not have been told um and you know and and, and you know uh, not Victoria but a number of other people in the study that I've spoken to are all in their 90s like 95 96 and I've really felt the urgency to to get some of those stories down and, and collect some of those materials because, um, yeah, in some ways that's that's the only place that things has, um, have been sort of preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and you you talk about Victoria having been a child, and so you sort of remember um, Cyril and Vani Monk as, as grandparents. Um, were they, was Cyril Monk still playing professionally in your memory? Or no, was he, he was examining. So mm -hmm. we used to see him go off and catch the ferry to to Kong, but no, he wasn't playing. Although I think I do remember vaguely going down, and there were little soirees. Mm -hmm. So there were these like Auntie Noor, who she was an opera singer, and so they were were doing playing. They must have been playing when I was probably sort of interested more in having a biscuit or something. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in the in the house. In the house. In the, yeah. the house was built. To, to have these soirees. So there was quite a big room. I remember that big room and a couple of pianos and um, so that's where they could all gather. Mm. Mm. And it overlooked the cove, which was amazing. And and all kind obviously all kinds of musicians are coming down to join. Oh they would have been, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who they were, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh that's so terrific. Um and so Julia you alluded there to the other other people you've been talking to. So your research has been sort of Cyril Monk was one of the starting places, but it's also a bigger story of musicians in Sydney at, at times. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about those, some of those other? Yeah. So yeah. So start with Cyril Monk, and because that was that was so exciting, um, I I wanted to um, not necessarily. Um, make any broad statements about how everybody played the violin in Sydney at this time, but just wanted to sort of draw out some threads of some snapshots, I guess, of, of really pertinent people. And um, two other violinists that you'll see in the exhibition um, are Phyllis McDonald and Patrick Mormont Mann. Patrick Mormont Mann, um, I, I was so intrigued by, I first came across him in the Powerhouse Museum archives because um, there was these concert programs and photos of him in an aeroplane and he described himself as the flying fiddler. And when I come across these, I'm like, I've got to come back to this because this is this is zany. Um, he he was a violinist who um, was very very popular in the 1930s in Sydney, um, and he was sort of um, only a concert violinist. He he gave lots and lots of recitals, but he was famous for these aerial concert tours where he used to. Um, get in a plane and fly all over New South Wales giving concerts in um, country towns and. Um, yeah, he was definitely a man of independent means because he had an aeroplane for a start that he used to pilot himself and he also had a Guarnerius violin. So he would go with his accompanist and his Guarnerius and get in the plane and just fly places to do concerts. And um, 
Yeah, and I just I thought that was just fascinating, and he's sort of well reported on in in the um in the newspapers, and um yeah, I've been really lucky also to connect with family members of Patrick Morgan who were kind enough to share um his reel to reel tapes. So um his daughter in law had kept all these tapes um that had belonged to her husband um and he'd saved them from his father, but he, uh, Patrick Morgan mum wasn't uh close with his children. So the fact that they've survived is, is quite amazing. And um, the tapes um, have been digitised for this study, but the tapes are hours and hours of his playing. They He recorded them right at the end of his life, so they recorded him in sort of the 60s. So he was quite an old man at this stage. Um, but what's really interesting and, and sort of what I argue in the thesis is I think um, he's really preserved the, the style of his younger years in the tapes. And What's really unique about the tapes as well is it's like not often that you can study a violinist and hear them practicing. Like often you're getting a recording where it's really beautifully edited or, you know, I, I think what's really amazing about the real to real tapes is they're, they're very, very raw. And uh, that's a wonderful insight into sort of his sort of playing style preserved. So, yeah, so Patrick Moorman's uh, one of the threads. And also Phyllis MacDonald um, was a violinist, also another child prodigy. Um, she went to London to study at the Royal Academy on scholarship and then she was shortly thereafter appointed as a professor and she played in BBC Orchestra and um, in Henry Woods Orchestra and then came back to Sydney and uh, taught um, violin and ensemble playing here in the con and uh, was regularly heard on ABC and I found some unpublished recordings, um, 78 records of hers. And um, yeah, she's got a, a beautiful style and I'm sort of coming to that aspect of the project. It's it's very much the case that um, the women in this story are less represented in the sources. So I'm, I'm going to have to dig deep for Phyllis. Um, but um, she also played in um, what was called the Sydney Instrumental Trio with um, Olga Krasnick was the pianist and um, Kathleen Tui was the cellist. And I've met Kathleen Tui's granddaughter, um, who's very warm and, and forthcoming. So I'm hoping to sort of um, explore that more at, at the final stages of the project. So they're, they're the three violinists and... And I guess I'm drawing out a picture of what concerts sounded like and what violinists sounded like and what these little threads of, of the story are from that. Um, yeah. I think I think for anyone who's skeptical about whether it's an interesting thing to do research, you you know, all this enticing detective work of following all these threads is really, you know, it's a sort of st I get really excited about it. Yeah. Not other people. Um, so that, so that's sort of musical side of things. So what? So listening to all these recordings and also finding all the fingerings and other markings on the scores, what has that led you to understand about the music or the performance of the music that you didn't understand yes. before? Okay, um, <laughs> let's talk about the scores first. Can we click to the first slide? Yeah, so um, I think, uh, so I guess I probably didn't make clear that there are very, very few recordings from Australian artists from this time. So there is a very short recording of Cyril Monk from a broadcast um, but the McMahon recordings are done in the 60s and there's just not a lot of recorded material. So in many ways, I'm um, reconstructing um, the sound of this time. One of the ways I've come at that is looking at the markings in the score and the fingerings and, and what story they tell about performance style. So I might actually um, play this now mm -hmm. and I'm going to... Um, I'm going to sort of play Cyril, this is Cyril Monk's fingerings and bowings and his tempo markings from the um, Schumann Schlummer lead. Um, yeah, and I mean, you, I guess you can hear for yourself what, um, what I, what, how I, I guess, um, realise those fingerings and markings and what they mean in, a, in a, what the auditory sort of um, consequences of, of, of um, replicating that score is, because that's one of the approaches that I've come to, so. Play. <laughs> hey. Oh, and I should say I'm playing. Um, I'm playing an Australian violin. I'm playing an A. Smith violin. It was made a little bit later than this time, but probably very much the sound kind of street. And playing on gut strings in the style that Cyril Monk um, and his associate would have played on. Thank you. 
um, yeah, so this is a favourite uh, little excerpt just because um, you can see the harmonic fingerings that he used and um, the beautiful effects when um, the fingering indicates that you move within one bow stroke or you move the same finger within one bow stroke. It creates those very sentimental sort of um, figures. If we go to the next slide, um, I, I've included a little bit of audio of Patrick McMahon. Um, there's just so much, there's so many hours of things to listen to. It's really hard. It's really hard to choose what to play you today. Um, but I've just um, included a little bit of his playing of the Brahms Sonata. Um, I was hoping that Neil might chime in with some thoughts on this because it, it's, um, I wish you put the score up because it's, I mean, there's so many um, times that it's so alarming sometimes what he does, but um, hopefully you, you can observe in this some sort of really unusual playing style. So just a little bit of the Patrick Moorman's Brahms. Yes. Do you want to say? I mean, do you want to say something about that? I just want to. I just want to say this is the question I, I've always thought about. Um, we sort of evidence from Australia. Yeah. For me, it, when it was recorded in sixty six. Yeah. I think this is uh, evidence of how people played in the late nineteenth century, century quite clearly. Yeah. In a Brahmsian way, I mean, all the portamenti, but also the changes of tempo, the rhythmic alterations that are going on. You just by this stage, you would not have heard this in in modern playing. So it's someone of this generation who's holding on to an old style. That's that's what I think. And such great evidence. It's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, Patrick Moore was yeah eighteen ninety eight. So I think I think you know a lot of the violinists here who were trained in those sort of very early decades were learning from teachers very much of the nineteenth century style. And I think because of our sort of geographic isolation, I think there's a good good argument that a lot of that was preserved in a way that it might not have been in Europe. It would have moved on in Europe and it was preserved here. Yes, yes, exa exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, and then I guess like one of the applications of this research, if we could go to the next slide, is just, um, this is just a piece from 1914 by Alfred Hill, and these are his fingerings and bowings. But um, I think one of the interesting things about the research is just listening to all these recordings and the research that I'm sort of doing, I think it, it just sort of, again, um, brings like a just a really broad palette of expressivity for, for music of this era. I think we don't think about Australian music of this era having um, a style associated with it, but I think when we hear it with, with sort of in the style of those recordings we just heard, it, I think it brings a lot of beautiful things to it. I think it's quite different from how we might imagine it with our sort of modern aesthetic. So I was going to play a little bit of this, um, I, and I'm just going to play it, um, I'm going to play it as I feel it. But I'm going to play it sort of also in, in the style of Patrick Moorman, so um, don't be surprised if um, my promise and I are not together. <laughs> we, practice, we practice not being together. Um, and, um, yeah, and, you know, the, the way he, he sort of vibrates on the really uh, integral notes to the phrase and a lot of the unevenness in his playing, I've tried to capture some of this in this lovely little opening of the vaults. So give it a go. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Thanks. Julia. How wonderful. <laughs> and um, and I was just thinking then it, we you know, should maybe be closing our eyes, imagining ourselves at one of the soirees, <laughs> listening to Alfred Hill's um, music rather than in this building. And that is also, it, there's more music um, down in the exhibition that people can use QR codes to listen to, and some of that has also been tied to some of your artwork. Yeah, sorry. So do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I made um, three ears. I had already made an ear, um, which was cast um, from a mould. I made a mould of an ear and then cast it in lead. And I use a lot of recycled stuff, so I found this mesh, um, which I, I don't know what it's for. It might be electrics, electrical thing or something. Anyway, when we started to do this thing, I then decided, well, we need three ears. <laughs> so I cast uh, three more, two more ears, uh, so we could have them just standing there, so that the the QR code would relate. So it is about listening. And part of the year was made because I started with the partly to do with the mesh to start with. It looked a bit like an old ear horn, and I thought it's just so typical of today. People aren't listening. Um, they're just not listening. They're either walking like this, but they're just not listening to the all around them all things. So that was part of the motivation. So this was sort of perfect to work in with, with the exhibition. So that's where the QR codes fit with each one. And I'll just say one of them um, is a soundtrack of my sister. When we talked about it, we did a lot of stuff either on the phone. We only met a few times mm. because she's a pretty busy woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this, I, my sister, my older sister lives in Vancouver. And so I rang her and said, what do you remember about Papa? And, you know, Mama, Papa and Mama have childhood. And she said, she said, oh, and then she started talking on. And then she said, when do you want it? And I said, now. <laughs> so she sent it straight away. And I was just meeting Junior the next day. And we sat down in one of the rooms down here. And this is technology where we did airdrop. <laughs> <laughs> and the sound straight into her computer and then was able to edit and just have a bit of my sister talking about my grandfather, or our grandfather. So that was one of them. And the other one was the 78 recording, 78 um, Papa play, which I had never heard before, so that was fantastic. Um, so I was able to send that to my sister. And then the other one um, is Julia playing Papa's arrangement, and that's another special thing. So that was fantastic, really. Yeah, I mean, how wonderful to weave mm. these past, past sounds and present sounds into and your new artwork. So do you want to say more about sort of how that's all come into this exhibition? Because then we might go down. Oh, yeah. mm. Well, it's just like, it's just lovely to have a visual representation of the story. And look, we've got everything from 78 players to airdrop. So the <laughs> whole gamut of technology is, is down there. But um, it's just lovely to have Victoria's work and have that personal connection um, as part of the exhibition and I'm very very grateful to Victoria for all of and the photos all the all the beautiful yeah. like family <laughs> items it really helps tell this story and I think you know um, you know I think people do really connect with the the photos and the items so um, and I love this idea that you can listen to the past through objects you can you can look at a piece of music and you can listen to the past and you can and discover it through all these things and that was the the theme of the exhibition that so delighted with how it's come together and, and grateful for everyone who's put in so much effort to bring it about. It's it's very um, exciting for us. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Lovely <laughs> note to finish on. And we'd like to invite everybody that we'd be really happy to hear questions, but maybe a nice way to do that would be to go down to the exhibition mm -hmm. and stand in front of it and have a look at it. And then you can ask Victoria and mm. um, Julia questions. And that, and um, so... It, for those who aren't completely familiar, if someone else want to do that, I'm just yes. Say okay. Well, Neil will say for you. <laughs> and um, but yeah, well, so we'll we'll go down there and invite everyone to so you have ask questions. I have yeah. one very quick question. Okay. Oh, well, <laughs> well, it's pertinent because you you said you know listening back and also, uh, what's the title of your uh, project? Yeah, after the Slim Dusty song, uh, looking forward. This looking back. forward. <laughs> looking forward and just thinking about because we've we've all heard your beautiful, absolutely stunning playing here today, and I'm interested to know how the work with the exhibition, work with uh, with Victoria, and 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 having all these things appear out of boxes magically. How what does that what has that done for your own artistry and your playing, 
which we've heard has the change and, and, and this forward-looking bit, that I'm yeah. just interested in that. Well, sort of what we are talking about with Anna before when we're talking about um, the individuality of expression. I mean, I, I, I like when I listen to Patrick Moore-McMahon especially, I have an overwhelming sense that he is singing to me and he's speaking to me and he's whispering to me and he everything he's playing feels like speech and it feels really personal. And that I've been very, I feel inspired by that because I, I love to listen to things that feel personal and feel like a, a story that um, is inclusive of me as an audience member. And so like, I would love my playing to be like that. And, and um, I think the length, there's, I think I'm discovering other ways um, within a musical language to be expressive. And um, it's not really to pit one style against another or one way of playing, but just this beautiful expansion of possibilities is the way I see it. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, that beautiful speaking style is something that really appeals to me and, yeah, my journey forward, I guess. Yeah. That's wonderful. And just tying in what Amanda said about the department, about finding these artefacts and then sonifying music through that is amazing. So uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. I'd like to thank Julia, of course, as the star of this show, and Victoria for giving up your time and, and all these wonderful stories. Um, Amanda, thank you so much for uh, the amazing work and also for steering this afternoon's discussion. Uh, also, Amanda Thomason, Sally for the judging, all the contestants are so great. And from the library, Sally, Jade, Lily, Edward Luca, who I didn't mention before, Will Pigeon, no to mention them either, and Stacey. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Helen and everyone from the CW class coming along today as well. It's really added something wonderful to the afternoon. It's been marvellous. Let's go down to the library.